Welcome back everyone from our little 15 minute break. And I'm pleased to introduce our final panel of, of today and our spotlight conversation of today before Alanis. Um, and this is the, uh, the asynchronous program uh, that hopefully many of you already watched. Black Youth, Social Hacking, and the Business of Digital Clout, Chicago's Drill Rap Scene in Retrospect. And joining us from that conversation um, is Jabari Evans and Nancy Bain. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the conversation over to them um, because as those of you who've seen the video know, um, they had a full discussion with the full panel, um, you know, reaching into the numerous themes uh, that, 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 that they set up for us. And they're just gonna introduce this and, and, and bring everybody into the conversation from there. So I hand it over to you, Jabari and Nancy. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I don't know how to do this. I feel like we did, this is like we were, doing it the second time almost. <laughs> um, we but talking about maybe talking about, you know, where, how this panel came together and where we started yeah. from. And, yeah. and, and yes. It, it, and I guess if people have questions, if they want to, you know, raise their hands and let us know. For but sure. Also, and also because it's a you two in this room, as I was able to say to Nancy before uh, we got you into the Zoom room, I um, was hoping that you'd kind of recapitulate how you two became connected around this project specifically, sure. as you talked about in the video as well. So that would sure. be great. And if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to go ahead and just put them in the chat window. All right. Um, hi, my name is Jabari Evans. If you have not watched the, the, the panel, uh, asynchronously. Uh, I am a PhD student at Northwestern University as well as a research fellow at the Center on Media and Human Development. But outside of my scholarly endeavors and, and probably much more well known uh, around here in Chicago, I'm known as a hip hop artist. And uh, so for many years I performed and recorded under the moniker of knowledge in a group called Kids in a Hall in our local hip hop scene here. Um, our hip hop scene is kind of split into two factions. If you're somewhat familiar with uh, Jeff Harkness's work on, on Chicago's hip hop scene, it's kind of, he, he kind of outlines it as being split into the backpack scene and the gangster scene. And he writes this work, you know, it's based on his dissertation. This is in like 2011 and 12, right? So I would say that my brand of hip hop was probably formed out of what he would deem the, the backpack scene. Um, however, um, as I got my master's degree and kind of moved into youth advocacy work and, and social work and mentorship, uh, kind of melding that with music education, I became a lot more familiar with what he would kind of characterize as the gangster scene in Chicago, um, just being that I am from the South side of Chicago. And so there was a brand of hip hop that kind of was really running, uh, I won't say running rampant, but it was definitely a very popular strand of, of hip hop that was, you know, popular amongst the students that I was working with while doing my dissertation work, uh, which is focused on hip hop based education in, in Chicago public schools um, called drill music. And drill music is kind of this strain of gangster music that, that centers very hyper local. Um, and it's kind of, infamous for its, you know, authenticity in terms of the ways in which it identifies the people, the places, and the spaces in which certain criminal activity happens on the South Side. And it's very much associated with different factions of different gangs and different crews and different cliques. Um, but the the melding of that with social media uh, was very curious to me. And it was something that you know, as I was leaving my dissertation work, which was very specific to this intervention and what it was doing for academic learning, I was starting to become a lot more interested in the ways in the the ways in which these youth were like forging careers outside of school, and and how that worked. And so, uh, a former mentor uh, from undergrad, Amy Jordan, had told me at ICA to go to Nancy's keynote and told me very specifically that her new book was like squarely surrounding some of these questions that I was having just very specific to the genre of hip hop. I go to the keynote and, um, you know, sure enough, she was spot on. Uh, <laughs> 
And then I became a stan. I was a Nancy Bame stan from that point on. And I said, hey, uh, there has to be some way that we can collaborate because I think the things that I'm seeing here in Chicago with these youth um, are very much adjacent to some of the, the points that you're making about relational labor. And I think even more fascinating was that these kids who, you know, are marked, you know, come from communities that are marked by what most would deem digital inequities weren't seeing it that way. They were, you know, very much so forging professional careers and, um, you know, defeating the internet, so to speak, and, and finding ways of, of, of toying around with the algorithm in ways that I think even those who were creating these algorithms uh, haven't intended and didn't realize was going on. And, and that's a super fascinating thing. And so um, she gave me the opportunity to come to Cambridge and we collaborated on some things that, that have spawned into this panel and a couple of conference papers. And I think we have uh, some publications that may be in the pipeline due to this. Um, uh, so I'll let Nancy give her, her, her side of it as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, so I had been interested for quite a while in these questions of how uh, how musicians were having to use or felt a pressure to use social media to forge more interpersonal sorts of relationships with audiences in order to uh, have some kind of sustainable career. And I had been working on that project for a long time that became that book, Playing for the Crowd. And um, I had tried really hard to interview people in hip hop and I had failed. So, uh, and I was very keenly aware that it was a genre that was missing. There are a lot of genres missing. I mean, it's not much yeah. classical music, there's not much jazz, there's, I mean, you can, the list of genres that are not represented is a very, very long list, but, but that was one where I felt like, oh, there's definitely interesting stuff happening here and I'm just not the person who can speak to it with the research that I've been able to do. So when Jabari reached out and was like, hey, can we do something around this in hip hop? I was like, yes, can you say yes fast enough? And so here we are. And then the people that you've put together for the recorded panel, I think, uh, do a really nice job of um, demonstrating what to me was so interesting about this scene, which I think you, you talked about, which is this idea. I'm always interested to see how uh, historically marginalized youth populations um, demonstrate talent and skill and expertise and knowledge and are able to use that strategically um, to better their situations. And I think that, that often, especially Black youth involved with gun culture and gang culture just get written off so completely that our, any kind of story that was about saying, actually, these are people with all kinds of talent and skills and technology in their hand, literally in their hand, and that's what they've got. And they're deploying that uh, at very early ages, incredibly successfully in some cases, uh, mm -hmm. in ways that are really reshaping music was just a, a really fantastic uh, story to want to tell. Yeah, yeah. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention for Stu Stewart, who isn't here, but um, he was another person who was very influential um, to me, like guiding through this project, because he, you know, he was doing research while at the University of Chicago um, during the time that I was doing my field work for my dissertation, um, and we were both kind of in the Hyde Park era uh, area. Yeah, Ballad of the Bullet. It just came out this year. Just came out, brand new. Princeton Prep, um, and his work was squarely. You know, we were kind of trading notes. At, at, mutual friend had introduced us and he was you know doing things that were squarely focused on like after school um after school programming that was kind of serving as intervention models for you know particularly violence intervention models for youth on the south side of chicago and and through that he started realizing that the music was so integral to their their culture that subculture that they were immersed in and just almost that in, in, in an interesting way how rap artists became emblems uh or almost figureheads or leaders of gangs when you know the the disbandment of uh the more organized structure of our gang culture here in Chicago happened and a lot of the leaders went to the federal penitentiary. Um, 
you know, the idea of gaining visibility and, and increasing one's reputation became increasingly tied to one's, you know, popularity on social media, one's ability to kind of gain what we call clout, um, which came up in his book as well, but it was something that I think I'm starting to more define um, in, in, in different ways. And even in talking with Nancy, we became, we started, you know, starting to define it in a, in a much realer way than just what was coming up in, in both me and Forrest's field notes. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, I definitely wanted to, to give a nod to kind of some of the things that he talks about in that, um, you know, black youth who have been quote unquote written off know that they're, they've been written off, know that they're being typecast, know that they're being stereotyped. Um, and they go about kind of exploiting that in their own way uh, in, in terms of gaining fame and um, pursuing this idea of being a professional rapper. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes that reputation comes with great risk. So, you know, over the summer, Nancy introduced me to, to, to um, Aaron Brook Duffy's book and, and, you know, how, you know, you're not getting, you getting, what is it, not getting paid to do what you love. Um, and there's a similar dynamic here, but the difference is it's kind of, instead of looking at those who are on one end of the spectrum, we're looking at those who are on the other end of the spectrum and kind of what do those who are have not to do um, without the level of education, without the level of access to uh, having nine to fives, they can kind of supplant their careers um, and are from these marginalized communities. You know, they still seek to be popular within their communities. They still seek to kind of utilize these tools. And and black black youth being power users of the internet, which has been you know proven time and time again statistically, uh, it's kind of it's fitting, you know, and, and so much work that's been done on black Twitter and just the ways in which, you know, African-American youth drive culture online um, in, in many ways and have their own space and place and subcultures within these platforms. Uh, I think, you know, it's a very interesting timestamp to look at drill when we're thinking about like 2010, 11, and 12, um, with the iPhone being very new and nascent in the ways in which, you know, Instagram is, is populating um, through different, um, you know, cities and kind of giving geo tags to where people are at and, and kind of lending more authenticity. When we think about hip hop and the type of genre that it is, it's very contingent upon one's music being very commiserate with the lifestyle that they're actually living. Um, and the, many of these youth, particularly those who are in, you know, I, I've just finished uh, a paper that I think will be probably, you know, I'm pending, you know, this final review will be in the, the Journal of uh, Global Hip Hop Studies. And in that paper, I'm kind of detailing like what what Doe, who's on this panel, is kind of talking about where he's saying, like, hey, we realized that there's a way that people looked at these neighborhoods that we're in. We realized, um, you know, that for us to kind of break through and kind of prove ourselves, we had to show that, hey, we're more authentic than these other scenes are. And even deeper than that, my block is more authentic than this other block. And so that intersects with the ways in which gang rivalries already existed in Chicago, um, but have been super accelerated through means of, of social media. And, and unfortunately, there have been some real life consequences where, where folks really are looking over their shoulder and wondering about their personal health and their, you know, you know, whether somebody's actually going to show up where they're at or where they're saying they're at online and, and kind of confront them about this reputation that they've built. Um, it, it, one of the questions that I had actually from seeing the presentation, but, um, uh, but also just kind of more broadly, is to what extent, you know, the transformation in platform, like the platform that becomes a platform of the moment or becomes popular at a given moment, how that's evolved um, because you were saying, you know, you were talking about when Instagram and geotagging in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you know, obviously there have been several references to conversations about TikTok already that have emerged just yes. throughout the conference. You know, 
have we seen any of these dynamics and any of the entrepreneurial dynamics that you also discussed in your presentation shift or reconfigure based on the platform or is it just repeating and you know the kind of same structure um you know over and over again but just on different platforms right yeah. right um i guess i'll i'll take this i don't want to dominate the conversation but um I think the newer stuff that I've been seeing with with some of the, the more recent interviews that I've done with different artists, and even throughout this conversation, you can you can hear it is that um, this idea of reputation has shape shifted. So when you know when Forrest is doing his field work, primarily that's like 2015, uh, 16, 17, you know, and so as things shift very quickly. Uh, throughout his book, he talks about how like your posts are permanent and that your reputation is permanent. And like the, the, the artists that I'm interviewing right now, every two or three months, they clear their entire profiles out. You know, they, they have the tools to kind of archive everything and recreate themselves in ways that maybe they don't want to associate with their, their former gang profile or whatever. Um, and then there's also like those who are using that as a strategy within and of itself to like say, hey, I have this new project or hey, my music has gotten better. So all of those links that I put up before, I don't really want you to see those. I want you to focus on this new project I have. Um, and, you know, that was fascinating to him because he was saying like, oh, man, like they're deleting their accounts. And I said, yeah, I have several people who have like gotten rid of their accounts altogether or they've cleared every post from the last 10 years because they want to start a new, um, you know, the stories Can feature. Can I just chime in and say that? Yeah. That that's, that, that's something that I know that people I, who I have spoken with who are looking at major labels are super concerned about was what's going to happen to the mental health of these young people when they're saddled with a decade of, of exposure. And I remember talking to one woman who said the advice I always give young artists is don't use your real name so you can do mm -hmm. exactly that and yeah yeah definitely you know the, the permanency of it i think this idea that you know you have this repository of evidence of who you are i think that's changing um and just even thinking about this panel and, and when hearing you know Doe talk about it or, or David, David Drake talk about the idea that like, you know, when he first encounters Chief Keith, he's 16. Chief Keith had a birthday last month. Um, and you would think in the ways in which people talk about Chief Keith that he's like 40 years old or something. He's 20. He's 27 years old. And he's had like a very lengthy career um, for hip hop's standards and, and like, in many instances, I think he's kind of spawned, you know, the drill scene in, in itself has spawned, but Chief Keith in particular has spawned like this new idea of what uh, a young hip hop star is supposed to look like, the ways in which they're supposed to engage with social media, um, how they're supposed to show their authenticity, um, even the idea of releasing a lot of music, you know, it doesn't have to be finished, it doesn't have to be mixed, it doesn't have to be well produced, it just has to be authentic. And then you let the fans kind of decide what's the single. Or, you know, even if we look at metrics, I think metrics, um, the ways in which Billboard measures popularity, you know, I think that was one thing Interscope was frustrated with in terms of Chief Keef is that, you know, all of his popularity seemed to be centered online and it didn't equate to sales where now, you know, we're, you know, this is like right before streaming becomes what it really is today. And, and so, you know, him releasing a song on Twitter that's not necessarily finished and becoming a trending topic, you know, at that time, the label is like, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? And I think that's kind of tactic that we see done time and time again within hip hop. Um, that's, that's, you know, by, it's, not, it's not out of the ordinary anymore. Um, you know, I think there's so many trends and that's kind of what the panel also kind of went into. Charnay Graham, who's another journalist, uh, mentioned some of these things and just the idea that, you know, some of these tactics, um, that labels kind of poo pooed and saw is like, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Um, this is off the beaten path. You know, radio isn't going to play this. You know, now 
that's an afterthought. You know, we have so many artists, uh, whether it be the little pumps of the world or the, you know, uh, little baby, uh, you know, Extacion when he re had a certain level of popularity. There's so many artists that kind of took this blueprint. Takashi Six Nine, you know, right now, you know, that some of these artists have utilized this 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 way of utilizing social media to kind of corral attention and kind of trick the internet, so to speak, in, in ways that um, I think spawn out of like people imitating what was going on in that drill scene during that, like that real short two to three year period. I'm wondering actually, Nancy, to what extent now that when you said before, when you were doing researching playing for, to the crowd and, 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 and in your other work, that you hadn't had the kind of access to um, hip hop scenes explicitly. Yeah. How do you think, you know, having the contact that you've had now, like being immersed in this particular project or in this collaboration has maybe shifted or transformed some of your own kind of broader theories about digital music, digital culture and sociability. <laughs> has it done that? I mean, has, has, has this, have these particular cases or case studies actually reconfigured or shifted some of, you know, like your amazing body of work on this stuff? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, it's an interesting question. I think, I mean, yes and no. I think that it, I don't feel like it made me say, oh gosh, I was really wrong about whatever. But what it did uh, open up for me are layers of ways in which when I had been thinking about fan community and I had been talking about audience community or scenes, I was tending to to locate them in spaces that were not intimately tied to the well-being of the geographic space in which people lived, mm. right? And to the ability to stay alive that members of that community might be experiencing. And mm -hmm. so I think that in, in some ways, I think that if we think about what's happening with music right this minute in COVID where so many venues are closing and that capacity to, um, the capacity of music to support a geographic community. Um, I think about things like the Music uh, Policy Forum and, and those kinds of groups that are advocating for uh, the music venue trust in the UK that are advocating for the preservation of, of live music venues and, and urban policies around music. Uh, it helps me see the connection of music and music scenes to the well-being of place because this is not true of all hip-hop scenes, but certainly in, in this hip-hop scene, which was so literally tied to, uh, to violence and to playing with the imagery of, of violence and of gangsterism at great risk to self so that people would be amping up, making it look like they were more violent and more drugged out and more involved in the scene than they really were because that would bring the hits to their, the views to their video, but in so doing it would also escalate the violence. So the ability to attract a crowd and corral together and put Chicago on the map and show that we had a scene and we mattered and we had skills was playing out also against this backdrop of the more visible I am and the more I foreground these aspects of the scene, the more danger we're in and the more danger I'm in. And there's no easy answers to how those pieces fit together. And I think they play out probably in very different ways in different places and different scenes. So I think it opens up that question of, of connection to geographic space and to physical well-being of communities that are not as visible when you're looking at people who are, uh, who are not written off to begin with, like Jabari said earlier, yeah. Jabari, is there something you wanted to add to Nancy's response in relation to that? No, I mean, I think it came together. It was interesting. I used to come into her office at, at Microsoft and we would, I would do these like brain dumps where like <laughs> I would have all of these ideas about how what 
was going on in the scene connected to the book or connected to this specific, I was out my pen and my <laughs> you know, and then literally she would just kind of annotate what I was saying and, and, and kind of piece those things together. I think, you know, the stakes being raised in certain scenarios, I think is what's clear about this particular case, but I think is also, you know, given the nature of what's going on in our country, I think we can see the nationwide, those stakes are kind of similar in places like Oakland and places like Philadelphia and places like Washington DC and places like Miami, New Orleans, like there are hip hop scenes that are directly tied to kind of speaking for this idea of resistance. Um, and I think, you know, I think the other thing that is unique is that uh, it's like we rise as a tribe rather than we rise as a band or we rise as an individual mm -hmm. artist situation, you know, because of the situations that and the communities that these artists come from, I think they viewed one person's win as the entire scene's win um and that we can build an ecosystem here which has happened here in chicago so now you have you know i interviewed andrew barber who's a very very important influencer tastemaker blogger here in chicago who runs a site called fake shore drive and you know he was telling me that like you know little dirt now employs 30 people chief keith now employs 20 to 30 people and like from songwriters to videographers that are local here to this market um, producers, you know, people have Grammy nominations, platinum plaques, you know, real credentials, and they haven't had to leave Chicago to do so. And so this is, you know, kind of the byproduct of what occurred in 2010 through 2013. And, you know, that's important. I think another thing to note is that the flip side of it is that, you know, I believe, and I think David Drake alludes to this in the panel is that, you know, without the drill scene, we don't get the scene that bursts like Chance the Rapper either, you know, because this is happening at the same time in the same city and it's kind of juxtaposed. And because of the internet, these scenes interact. Um, we're both from Chicago. So what, to, well, how are you making yourself visible? And I think Idris talks about this. It's like he was throwing parties at the time. He was in nightlife. So he was seeing all the scenes come to one venue all at once. And so those things would play out differently um, if the, the digital tools and technologies weren't there. And so now you have kind of kids like Chance who come from more middle-class backgrounds interacting with youth who are in proximity to them, but just wouldn't cross those boundaries otherwise. And so, you know, I think that is unique to this case and, and connecting to like playing to the crowd. We are the crowd, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like we create it and then we move out into the world and populate data. I'm wondering if any of, uh, looks like there's some folks besides us who are- Yes, yes. Ending. I'm wondering if-, if Yeah, we have about 10 shy. Yeah. We have about 10 minutes, 15 minutes for questions. Um, Anybody want to raise their virtual blue hand or um, type a message in? Oh, we have um, a raised hand. I'm going to unmute you, Alex. Wait, I don't know why lower. Okay. Mm. Hi. You're on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi there. Yeah, thanks so much. I really, um, it was a really great uh, oh, uh, presentation and mm -hmm. panel as well. Um, but yeah, I'm interested in a few things. I, I want to just um, want to sort of probe into like when you speak about the use of social media and digital clout, and sort of the balance between like the use of social media, but also the use of like how it capitalizes upon real life acts. So I'm thinking about how like Chief Keef and his gun charge and house arrest, and then during that time, he did loads through YouTube. So it's like a real life incident led to a point at which he then used social media to capitalize upon that real life incident. If that makes sense. So you're using uh, real life occurrences then capitalizing upon those in the social domain. And then also about um, what you were speaking, Jabari, about like um, the, how it's the social clout being pioneered in Chicago. Do you think it's just like a specifically Chicago thing? Because you mentioned chance as well. Or do you think that's just like a general trend through digital democratization that was latched onto by these artists? So kind of two things that I'm interested in. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. So I just wanted to 
to hear your thoughts on that, I guess. I guess the first thing I kind of refer to that in this, this conference paper I just wrote is social hacking, which is actually a term that I took from Craig Watkins and, and it's something he talks about in his most recent book, or I hate to be citing so many people, but I, I'm in dissertation mode. <laughs> uh, yeah, Craig Watkins talks about this idea uh, in his book, The Digital Edge, and he talks about like social hacking, which is where black and Latino youth use digital tools and technologies to kind of make something out of nothing. Um, and in making something out of nothing, they innovate in ways that kind of influence the rest of the industry or in the rest of the sector or the profession. And it's kind of a bottom up thing where kind of those who are um, under constraint, he compares it to startup worlds. So it's like, in essence, Chief Keef is almost like a bootstrapped startup, right? And he, he figures out how to get venture capital but in doing so, he's just scrapping his way um, through the technology and figuring out ways that he can kind of manipulate it to his advantage. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of what I see there. And I think the, in tying that to your second point. Can I just on that first one, isn't he also, he's staging some of the stuff in order to be able to film it right. for social media. So it's not that all of these things are happening of their own natural accord and then he's capturing them on social media to put them right. on YouTube. But so he's going, what will play well on YouTube? I know we'll go to that place and we'll bring a lot of guns and we'll look really tough and we'll film it and we'll embed some threats and we'll put it online. And then so it becomes something by virtue of the, of the fact that social media is out there and the iPhone is there in the hands to make it possible. <laughs> Right, Doe Do mentions that in the panel is kind of like videographers served as radio stations and MTV were to like my um, cohort of, of artists who were like breaking into the industry and that the videographers had the subscribers, had the, the, the professional tools um, to shoot them, right? And would come to their neighborhoods and when they didn't have access to those tools and often the money that they would pay these videographers would come from, you know, street activity. And that's just, you know, they were making the best and making do of what they had. And, you know, often that meant recording a song the same day record and shooting the video the same day. Right. And <laughs> it didn't matter if it was finished. It didn't matter if it was edited. It was the rawness and authenticity of it that kind of propelled it in a way. Cause I think these professional tools kind of gave light to aspects of Chicago that artists like Lupe Fiasco, Kanye West, Twista even, like some of these more popular hip hop artists that were signed from Chicago, they weren't going to these neighborhoods. They couldn't shoot in these neighborhoods. They couldn't get the permits. They couldn't get their labels to kind of sponsor this. Whereas, you know, this was kind of the chitlin circuit of hip hop. And I think, um, and speaking about Chicago's place and importance in this, I think because Chicago is so spatially segregated, these digital tools were utilized much more to these artists advantage. Whereas in places like Oakland, uh, places like uh, Houston, um, places like New Orleans, even where I've been in those scenes and seen how they interact and, and move in unison, a lot of that stuff was happening more in person. But the, the, the risk involved in like going from the South side to the West side of Chicago, if you don't know anybody over there, is real and it's life threatening <laughs> if you don't know what's going on. And I think these digital tools allowed a way for these these people to speak freely um, without consequence. Um, I th I, this new project that I'm kind of like thinking about and, and thinking about like female artists in this scene and kind of their role is this idea of the power that they're able to elicit online versus in person face to face right and, it's, and i think it, it speaks to you know some of the artists like cardi b and meg the stallion who have kind of emerged and, and and not just emerged but came in this in the game kind of without a cosign which i i point out as being something is that's important to succeed um even in this digital era um and they've done so in a way that's, that's super independent and super like on their own, um, you know, and, and I, 
you know, I just really, Jeff Lane talks about this as well in his book, the, the space in which females play in which they can kind of tra transverse neighborhoods and kind of transverse these gang rivalries um, without having to deal with the same type of consequences. And some of that has to do with the aesthetic and the sexiness of what it is they may present in their music. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's a similar thing going on at play where when I talk to some of these female artists who are from this scene, they know exactly what they're doing. They know exactly how they're utilizing um, their, you know, their, their clout, which has kind of come from more male viewers being on their page and, and being attracted to them and utilizing that to like get gatekeepers to repost and retweet and, and kind of push their music out there. Um, and so, yeah, those are, those are some of the, the, the interesting things that I think are unique to Chicago. And I think just the fact that there are no real physical labels there still, um, <laughs> it's just a lot of talent. Um, you know, I think that desperation uh, has raised the stakes in this place to where I, you know, I call it kind of the hip hop mecca of web 2.0. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions or comments, or does anybody else want to follow up based on that so far? I mean, this is, there's also, I know that um, you've all um, already been in conversation for a while, but um, this is also a moment where if you have any lingering questions for each other, this is what we've asked all of our panelists, if you have any lingering questions for each other, or if anything's come up in the discussion, today that you would want, like to follow up on, feel free to do so. We shared so many lunches, I'm just like, <laughs> you're on mute, Nancy. I'm wondering if maybe you would like to go back to the comment you made earlier about um, taking the notion of clout that is out there in common common everyday talk and also that Forrest Stewart lays out a lot and bringing it down. We spent a lot of time talking about what are the specific kinds of cloud and what are the specific strategies that you mentioned that trying to you know come up with a more grounded approach to thinking about what digital cloud is and what it looks like. Maybe this would be a nice moment for you to kind of bam, 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 here's digital cloud. Yeah. Um the three things that are specific to hip hop, you know, and, and kind of, I think that is also something that I want to make clear is that I think clout has moved from a space of being very central to one community and has been now appropriated by the industry at large. So now when people talk clout, a lot of times they're talking about YouTubers and TikTok, uh, you know, influencers and things like that. But I, I wanted to be very clear that a lot of it, a lot of what clout kind of encompasses is the able, the ability to kind of wield one's reputation to, to hold power within one's physical world um, and gain materially. So, you know, the ways in which these youth from this scene did that were First, you know, it's kind of like a step, you know, first step is to assemble a team. You know, that's what we call corralling. And that's kind of how we say, okay, you, you, you put together the different ingredients that it would take to reach kids in every single territory. And that's why it's kind of so interesting that it's tied to kind of this gang mentality of like, okay, you run that block, I run this block, you run that block, you're the stylist you get the clothes, you deal the drugs, get us the money to pay for the videographer, the videographer does this. Everybody has a piece in this and then everybody has an account, everybody is posting. Then there's, you know, there's even like a person who's on the team, which Keith was actually the artist and resident nerd who understood how to personalize MySpace pages, understood how to um, create memes, understood how to do these things that were that the entire team could then retweet and populate within and between platforms and kind of drive the algorithm locally to say that this is trending or that is trending. Um, you know, uh, 
Forrest even talks about how like the recommender systems within YouTube, if you have one artist that has created something, you put, then put hashtags that associate those things. So that was more how that corralling occurs. And then hopefully you get what, you know, Julian Lee would call like this moment of, uh, this, this moment of continuation, uh, this, this moment of continuation uh, where you're kind of validated by somebody who's already within the industry. Um, his Ju Young Lee's book, Blowing Up in South Central, was kind of talking about South Central rappers who come from an open mic scene uh, called Project Blowed. But in this instance, on using digital tools, uh, we're thinking about like Drake hitting G Herbo and saying that his song is the stuff and just retweeting that one retweet gets then hundreds of thousands of likes and then their team is then able to make sure Chicago knows that Drake has then co-signed this. In this panel that we had, um, both artists that were managed by the, the artist managers that were on the panel had different co-signs. King Louis was co-signed by Drake. Um, Drake offered to sign King Louie, but there were some contractual issues with his deal through Epic that didn't make that work. And then Chief Keef was co-signed by, by Kanye West when Kanye actually bootlegged his song and released his song with a version with him on it um, to Chief Keef's dismay. But that's still a co-sign that, that went out into the universe. And so, you know, that's, that's one thing. And then the co-sign. <laughs> you know, then the last thing that, that we kind of dealt with is capping, which is this, this, this art form of kind of impression management and views and likes are kind of the thing, right? And so, you know, this ways and anything that we can do, like cloud is measured in likes, views, downloads, streams, you know, now there's a lot of numerical data. The, the stuff, you know, some of the artists I talk to now use artists for Spotify, like Spotify for artists, and they're figuring out where they can just go set up shop and do a show. I mean, not now within COVID, but like, you know, they were like, oh, we have fans of San Francisco. Then let's get an Airbnb. Uh, let's get together, rent a car. We're going to go to San Francisco. We're going to stay there for a week. We're going to meet the promoters, and they're going to, you know, we're going to show them these numbers, and they're going to give us a concert. You know, and those are tools that weren't necessarily there for them. And so, you know, GoFundMe's will get started where it's like, oh, do you want us to do a show in the city? And a lot of that is driven by these metrics, you know. And so, you know, Capin is, you know, I had one of my um, respondents who would just talk about how he would post and kind of recycle the same pictures of him holding bundles of money in different places, put geo tags that kind of indicated that he was eating at Nobu or that he was shopping at Louis Vuitton. And my, all of these pictures might've come from one weekend, right? But he figured out ways to kind of manipulate it in a way in which it looked very authentic. Um, have friends take videos of him while he was doing these, these things. Um, whether it be getting on a plane, going to LA or going to Miami, you know, hundreds of photos are then taken and, and made to be populated over the course of maybe six months to appear as if you're in and out or you're bi-coastal. Um, and, and similarly, pictures while you're on the block, those things are made to feel like your authenticity is real. If once a week you're posting a picture of you with the homies on the block, you know, on in a neighborhood that has, you know, a real infamous reputation. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about in terms of that is like closeness to those who are a part of that life who have passed on. So these ideas of R RIP, dedication posts that often appear on Instagram. Uh, recently, an artist by the name of FBG Duck was actually killed um, on Oak Street. If you're familiar with Chicago, that's, that's the Magnificent Mile, Michigan, off of Michigan Avenue. He got killed in front of the um, Valentino, I think the Valentino store, or Dolce & Gabbana, I forget. But either way, like he was literally murdered like execution style and then you see populated a lot of local artists post pictures that they had with him to indicate how close they were to him now some people would say that's real and then some people would say that's capping you didn't really know him you took one picture with him but that gives you authenticity or clout to say hey 
he was willing to take a picture with you. And so these are the ways in which they're manipulating kind of these tools to kind of show off uh, a level of authenticity that I think is pretty particular to hip hop. Thank you so much. I think that also that that metrics of digital clout, that like lovely list and, and uh, that we ended with, where we got to have like really specific, you know, key uh, ways of measuring clout um, is, is going to be really helpful for a lot of us in, in thinking about, um, you know, how these transfer over into other kind of musical genres and into other kind of online worlds as well. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Jabari. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you. For, and thank you, everyone um, who participated in the um, the video that's available on the PopCon page. Um, you can see the full conversation there. Um, and of course, we really like to thank Mopop, Robert Rutherford, who is our technical host today. Um, and uh, we have concluded, barring the keynote, our first week of panels for virtual PopCon 2020. Um, something that we thought might not actually happen, but to be honest, we've been having some great conversations even online. So really appreciate you all. Um, be prepared for Alanis uh, coming up in about 40, 44 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, the link, um, youtube.com slash NPR music for that keynote, Alanis in conversation with Ann Powers. Um, and with that, I sign off uh, for week one, from week one of PopCon 2020. Thank you, Nancy. Thank, Thank you, Jabari. You. Thank you, Karen, Cheers. for all of your hard work and everybody making this happen. Thanks. Jabari. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all of you who showed up. Bye. <laughs> Bye.